Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. When I sat down to make my top 20 drum grooves of all time video, this was actually the easiest list to make since the first three grooves, numbers one and two and three, are all based on the Purdy Shuffle. <laughs> The first one being Steely Dan's Home at Last, which is the original Purdy Shuffle. And then you have Rosanna by Jeff Beccaro, which is a variation of the Purdy Shuffle. And also Fool in the Rain, which is John Bonham's variation of the Purdy Shuffle. Well, last week I had the incredible honor of interviewing Bernard at the Power Station in New York City. This is a long video, so I suggest watching it in segments. And I want to remind people to subscribe to my channel and hit the like button before you even begin. I actually start out with Bernard when he shows up at the studio getting his drums taped up and tuned up. I thought it was interesting, so I included it before the video begins. Here's my interview. Tell me what you're looking for with that as far as the hi-hat, hi uh, the tightness of it. I'm looking click. More of the click. This, uh, you know, it, it basically has, uh, everything is a little tight, much too tight, so I don't get the, a little bit of an overtone. But I got to do something with this hi hat. See, this is this is the problem. When they came out with see, see the size of these, yeah. everybody thinks that the bigger it is, <laughs> and when you can keep it tight, you can control it. Mm -hmm. Uh. -uh. Mm -mm. You just, all you've done is taken all of the overtone and ring where you want this to be. Because as this is right now, very little control is going to happen. And that is, that's the natural sound. Yeah. But it, in order to have it that way, you got to leave. A little bit of space. Hmm. Yeah. Just a little bit. Just enough, yeah. I used to tear up a t-shirt. <laughs> and that goes back 40 plus, 40 plus years. And it worked. It just worked. Because the engineers that I have, especially RCA and Columbia, the big studios. Yeah. They were like, whoa, what a difference. You know, and didn't have that overtone and that ring that kept going. Yeah. Uh, so they, um, they, they did everything. Ah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So with that in mind, Where it was. Yep. Uh, no, closer. I was closer uh, to the ridge. And then I didn't have to tape it down. I just let it hang. Just let it hang. And just only the tape would be approximately one inch. And would the microphone typically be there? Is that where people would mic, mic the snare mic back then or no? What I did, yeah, the snare mic. Mine was good for the snare and the hi-hat. Right. Nobody would use a hi-hat mic back then, right? No, nobody. Right. Hey everybody, it's my honor to have 
one of the greatest drummers that's ever lived, Mr. Bernard Purdy. Oh. As my guest today, Bernard, it's so unbelievably great to have you here. And I've been actually filming Bernard with my phone as he was tuning up the drums and getting the drums set. And I learned so much about this. I actually want to talk about this first. Talk about what you were saying about the hi-hat as far as adjusting the hi-hat and the clutch and however how that what t talk about that i thought that was so interesting well thank you thank you first of all <laughs> the clutch on the uh hi-hat the taller one is the worst kind simply because you're taking the volume you're taking the time wise you want less and less and less of overtone and ring. Right. Is what you're looking for. Yeah. So if you can keep it tight, so the better clutch itself works better. Yeah. It just works so much better. I know that most of the <laughs> clutches that they make now <laughs> are long and it's almost... Almost two inches long. Yeah, they need to go back to making shorter ones. You have, if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty, right, and keep things tight. Yeah, because everything, everything that you do, the tighter you are able to keep it, the smoother it's going to come out. Okay, speaking of tightness, let's talk about the drums too. You talked about the snare, for example. You used to use T-shirts at first, and then you went to the, you have paper towels on there now. Well, talk about the overtones and why you <laughs> want to re, why you want to get rid of these things. Well, you you only want to get rid of when you don't have it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest problem is is that when I started bringing things down and adjusting. Yep. It was a t-shirt that I had to cut up. Yeah. So I couldn't keep cutting up t-shirts all <laughs> around the world. So I had to go to paper towels. Yeah. And you got to be very, very careful, even with paper towels. Yeah. You can't use two, three, four, five paper towels. Right. Because eventually you're going to hit it and you're going to bring things down. So you're going to have to change until it comes back to a certain sound that you want that you're looking for that sound is what you're going to consider no matter what it is overtone and ring you do not want anything to take you too long to get to when you would be in a session would you go and listen to a playback and say, oh, I want to adjust this. This needs to sound more like this. Or how would you do it? Or would you just do your one take and you'd be out of there? Well, most of the time we didn't get more than one take. <laughs> so the thing is, is that I end up working with engineers. Yeah. They were always the big time engineer, the big studios, Columbia, RCA, Capital, Atlantic. It didn't matter. The thing was, is that I was creating my own sound. Right. So I wanted it to always be what I sound like when I play. Yeah. So in order to do that, I had to adjust. I always had to end up adjusting to the sound of the drum set itself. Now, at the time, all right, the 22 inch was still the big thing. 24 was on its way out the door. Right. 26 was almost gone. Right. But 22 was all tightness. You still had an overtone. You still had a ring. Yeah. So in order to manufacture constantly the same, I had to adjust. And I adjusted with a T-shirt to get the base part that I wanted. And the bass part allowed me to, just to uh, demonstrate. Yeah. Always cutting the ring totally in half. Yep. But 
the other part of that is that when I wanted to do something else and not go here with the, I could also get almost the same. Right. With the cross stick. There was a lot of work that I did with cross stick. Yeah. And so much of the work that I'd end up doing with cross stick is because the Purdy Shuffle came into the picture and they didn't know what it was. But it was already working and it was working on ballots and it turned everybody's head because they didn't know where it was coming from. They didn't understand that I could keep that kind of feel going on and be happy because it was a happy feel. So in the beginning, you know, a lot of guys just... Well, it's close, but I call it no cigar <laughs> because I did not want it just on the snare. Right. I needed the hi-hat to go with it as well. Right. Keeping it simple. Yep. There used to be a saying. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Not calling anybody, but just keep it simple. That's all. You just think simple and you place it and it all comes together. Let's talk about the ghost notes, the rebounds, how that how that adds to the groove. Well, that'll add about fifty percent of the feel. Yeah. Ghost notes are ghost notes. It has absolutely nothing to do with that when people thinking that you you got to play all No, 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 no. It is not about I started off with the ghost notes in the beginning. I started off with the bass drum. Right. Then I came up to the snare drum. Mm -hmm. Then I came over top of everything else when I needed to make a fill to whereas most of the fills was not do go do go do go do go do go do go dum. I did that in the beginning. Right. Because that was natural. That was normal. Yeah. But what mine became natural and normal was this. You cut out all of the double time. Right. And you only end up using one beat to a beat and a half. That's it. It stays out of the way. For stays out of the way. That's right. And this way, when you hear that, the singers love it because you're not in their way. That's right. And they get happy. Yeah. Man, everybody stays happy. It made my job easier. But it also made the engineer's job work because it gave that little lift. It's all about everybody being happy. No matter who is singing or playing, there's always a problem when too many people are trying to give you a fill, trying to give you their thing. Guitar players, they will take in a minute. Now, when you got something slow, you don't get a beat and a half. Right. You get boop, pap, <laughs> boom. And that end up on the downbeat of the one mm -hmm. with everything else still going on. I want to play you something that, of course, that you played on here. When I play this for you, huh, do you remember being there? Oh, yeah.
I want to ask you about this. Okay, you're tracking this. Who's playing with you on oh, this? Oh, I have Chuck Rainey. Yep. On the bass. Yep. Paul Griffin. Yep. On keyboard. Are you playing to a click track? No. Not in the beginning. <laughs> okay, so what would you do? Would you count this off? Or, or what, would the piano enter? Or was there no piano even on it? Not in the beginning. Like piano what? had the feel that it wanted. Yep. Paul Griffin played the licks that were necessary, that was needed. Yep. And my job is to still keep it moving and stay out of the way. Do you even know what the song sounds like when you're doing your basic track, though? Oh yes. Okay. Oh yeah. You, so you have a, you have a you have an idea what kind of where where you're gonna play, what the feel is. Are you even talking to the guys before this? And you say, okay, this is. I know you explain them. This is what I, I, I watched them talk about it. Mm -hmm. About you said, why don't we try the pretty shuffle? The funny part is that even then, most of the people did not understand what the pretty shuffle was mm -hmm. about. So, the Purdy Shuffle works. It works with anybody at any time. But the one thing that is so important is you cannot do this fast. It's half time. Right. It's cut in half. Whatever your tempo is, it's cut in half. And it always sounds like a ballad. You know, it came from the triplet. It came from the upbeat. It came to the downbeat. It came all the way around. But also, the ghost note. And when I first started doing this, even when you're doing it easy, it's a two bar phrase. That two bar phrase gives you the backbeat on three of each bar. So, if you relax, you'll get it all simple and not worry about how many or how much of the feel and attitude that you're looking for. You'll think about everybody else in the band to stay out of their way. Because the less that you do, the better it's gonna be. But we gotta remember the bass player, the keyboard, da 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 da, and the bass is moving. It's moving. And then when you come out of a verse and go into a chorus, you add just a little bit more. Right. And you add that backbeat coming down on three of the bar. And it doesn't matter what you're doing it with your hands or not or whatever. It's going to be heard. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Those ghost notes, let them stay ghost notes. Right. Let it stay. You don't have to play the exact same thing every time. You don't. You just play it so it moves. It goes with the body. It goes with the flow. And when it goes with the flow, you build the song until you come into that heavy backbeat. And then when you want to get to where it's going to have a break or you're going to have something, one of these things. Oh. Instead of playing that, yep. One note at a time. Yeah. Well, then he's, those speak when you when you have one note at a time. It's got so much clarity. Exactly. Right. When you were in the session recording this, how far are you and Chuck apart sitting there? Are you in separate rooms, ISO booths? Are you are you looking at each other? Is he playing this far away from you? What well, were those sessions like? They usually he's. Like where you are, like you're sitting here. He's sitting here with his bass, yeah. and you're looking and at him. And he's up just a little bit like this. Okay. So I don't have to turn my head on my body. Yeah. I can see him just like this. Yep. The keyboard is usually over here on this side. Yep. The guitars, when they're 
playing with us. And how often was that when the guitars were playing? Very often or no? On these Steely Dan tracks? Not necessarily together. Yeah. But the ones that could hold their own did their part. Yeah. Because they could always fix theirs. Not so much where the bass and the piano is, but they can always fix the guitar, stick it in, stick it out, and move it around. It was just a way of life. Now, that. would you read charts, or would they play you a demo of the song, or would they have a chart for you that would be sitting right here? What would you do? Tell me, how, tell me the process of doing a song like this, Home at Last. Well, Home at Last, like most, of Steely Dan, you had two, three, four different bands that played the song. Right. They weren't happy with what they were getting yep. because it wasn't working that way. Because yep. they didn't want to shuffle, they didn't want this, and they didn't want that. <laughs> and then I finally told them, I said, it's the Purdy Shuffle. No, we don't want to shuffle with them. I said, but you haven't heard it. <laughs> Listen to it first. <laughs> then you'll hear where we're coming from. Half time is half time. But the feel of it gives Chuck Rainey a chance to bounce. Yep. Gives Paul Griffin a chance to bat. Da, da, do, da, da. <laughs> Everybody's got the part. And then we all lock in just like this. And I don't care how many instruments they want to put on. They got room. They have so much space in, in the There's groove. So much space. Yeah. Having that positive attitude about your field of what you're doing is everything. Everything. You and I were talking a few minutes ago about Jeff Picaro and Rosanna. Well, he used to come and watch me play when I go to California. Yep. I was working with his father. Yep. We were doing movies. We were doing recording sessions. And we were everything. You name it, it was getting done. His father was also one of the big, big contractors. Mm -hmm. But he was also the main person when it came to movies because he played so many different instruments to make all these sounds happen. And that's why we work so well together. But his son used to sit on the floor right behind me. Every job that I did with his father in California, he'd be there. And when the breaks and stuff would come, he'd ask me the questions. Purdy, well, how did you do this? Why did this <laughs> such and such? And I didn't mind. I didn't mind, never did, because I had been teaching for a long time. But the beauty of it was watching him and the break, we'd go out and have some lunch or something. He'd be sitting down there learning how to do it and not being, even though he was reversing and putting it on the one right. instead of the three. Yeah. The, end, the bass had to think differently. Right. But then you also, the piano had to think differently as well. Right. Because the one is almost like doing and coming into reggae, coming to something calypso. Some right. Whole different ballgame. Right. But he had the foresight to see that music and let that one happened with him and people it just turned everything around but it was it was the purdy shuffle played differently and it worked like that's why the song is still so big today there's yeah. millions yeah but that's the beauty of it when you take something and you recreate and make it work for something else that you're doing and he did so I want to play you another track here that that is you that I, that I love.
Okay, so <laughs> when you hear when you hear this, then they just put you in a great mood. It, puts it is me a, great in a great mood. mood. It's a great mood because you hear every instrument separately. Yes. But when you put it together, yep, it's a monster. It is a monster, and I get a chance to play everything, everybody's part, right? Piece of everybody, and I loved it. There's a fill that you do. Right here. Okay. All right. Let's talk about that hi hat fill. That's 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 unbelievable. I'm play. I'm play it again. Hold on. This is, uh, this is, uh, Okay, so how did that, that become a signature kind of fill for you with the, with a hi hat like well, that? Well, <laughs> that particular one was when I had an open and closing of the hi hat. Yep. When that whole thing was happening for me, it was something that was steady, very steady, in and out, and nobody's way. Right. It's going to be heard. It's going to be understood <laughs> by everybody because that's, it happened to be a fill that is workable. And you can overplay it if you want. It's still going to sound so good. <laughs> psh, psh, psh. It was that circle that I put into the music mm -hmm. that became life for so many other drummers of the world. Yeah. They play that. It's just tightness, but you got to be very, very careful about your hi hat. And the tighter you can keep this, the better it is because it's out of the way and it works every time. Now, is this something you just stumbled on improvising when you were doing a session or is this something you worked on? You were like, how do I, how do I put this, put something like that Believe in there? Believe me. Everything that I do, I worked on it. A lot of it didn't work in the beginning mm -hmm. because it was like overplaying. Yeah. But when guys started to hear where it was placed, they found other places where they could do something. And that is how this, that particular part of the beat, in and out, it's a 16th note end up closing. Yep. With the sound, the sound itself, tight. So in order to make sure that it was tight, you just can't have a hi-hat that's loose. <laughs> unless you hear it. But when it is super tight, <laughs> you don't have to do it loud. Right. It comes, <laughs> it comes right at you. It comes at you and it works like a charm. And where it works the most? Playing disco. Okay. They took that. That's the sound of disco right there. That's the sound of disco. <laughs> mm. That's right. <laughs> and the bass drum. Mm. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Then, then what I started doing is not just that. Yep. I would do half as much on the bass drum and end up tighter, tighter. So this would take part the second part of them. I could do my bass drum like this and the engineers <laughs> they loved it because there was nothing in the way. Right. And the folks got their thing when it came down to disco. The beat. You're 110 to 120, disco. And that went good 10 years. A good 10 years until things started changing again. You know, before all of that, the shuffle, or the plain old shuffle, the blues, and all, everything work, keeping it simple. In this song, you're coming up to the solo, mm -hmm. you have this build 
you know there's going to be a solo there, and you 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 want to do something special there, right? I'm going to play it again, Bernard, because it's so amazing. <laughs> That's the perfect spot right before the right before the guitar solo. I mean, it's exactly. it's a perfect lead-in. It's a hook. It's a hook. It's a hook. And it's a, like you said, it's a lead-in. It's a lead-in. And it's out of the way. Now, did you just play it the first time? <laughs> yes, you did, right? Yes, of course. I did. You did only one take, probably, right? Yeah. The point is, is that it only takes one tape. One take <laughs> is what it does. Because eventually, no matter what, working with Steely Dan, you're going to play... 50 to 75 takes. Right. That's what it was. That was just known throughout the, the whole rumor for the business. <laughs> and what happened with me, once we got it, yeah. and I'm happy with it, then I would tell them, I said, okay, we got it. Now, all the person, I said, no, 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 hear me out. All I let, just want to let you know that it's in the first take, the second, or the third. You can do as many as you want. I don't care. But you're going to go back to the first, second, and the third because that's where everybody, right? Everybody is on. And no matter what we do now, you know, it. We don't always hit. It, it is that one time where everything works like a charm for everybody. Everybody is perfect. And it always works. And that's where my big mouth came in. I couldn't help myself. I just, I just want them to know that they have it. But now you can do as many takes you want. And they did. We've done up to 100 takes in some things. <laughs> oh hey, God. they paid well. They did not argue about how long or the time or anything else. They did what they had to do. And we got paid well for doing our job. There's another song on that record that is, to me... Now, I have the solo drum track of this. Oh, you do? I do, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, let's see if this plays but here. But that whole thing is Chuck Great. A tempo like this too is the hardest to play. It is. That's like that is such a hard tempo to to, to groove on, and you're killing it there. You know, Why is it so such a hard tempo? Because it's that mid tempo kind of. Uh, it is mid tempo, but that the problem is is that when somebody gets happy, the tempo rises, and right. if you rise, you're you're coming out of the groove of everybody. Right, Chuck. Rainy on that on that bass, it just works. The guitar, it works. Now they have to usually have to stay where they are for practically the whole track. But then they know that they can come in and add something else. Yeah. Paul Griffin never had to worry. He get his right from Chuck. We all did. So Chuck would give me the chance and the opportunity to make sure that I get a little fill in, but I hold everybody together. That's my job. I become Mr. Temple. Yeah. I become the click track because I wasn't using the click track then. I didn't use it. And when Chuck wants to go up, you know, whoop, and slide up here, oh yeah. And you're looking at him too when oh, you're yes. playing. You guys are looking at each other. I'm looking at him. And, and and ready to smack him. And it gives him a chance to play his part, get his little thing in, and and we just follow one another. Paul Griffin, he just, I've never seen anybody, anybody, play the piano and come down 
<laughs> like this. He comes down like this. And he's always right. We back each other up. And then I don't have to do anything but keep the time. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. And I don't need the click track. But as time went on, because they wanted the click track to put other instruments in. I was just going to ask you that. When they insisted on it, I said, no problem. You do a take like this. It may be the first or second take, whatever. Would you listen back to a, to a take after you do one or you don't listen? Oh, yes. You go back and you say, oh, I like this, I like this. And oh, would you talk about it? Would I'd you look at Chuck and you guys would talk? Or would you, Donald, say, what when would When they, they want something, you don't, you know, you don't talk and just don't worry about just that. You just don't talk because they want another take the same right then and there. They say, okay, fine. Would you have the tempos locked in? I can only remember one time that they asked for it to be a little faster. Yeah. But not this song. When I found out that they had already pre-recorded the songs with other bands, whole bands. Yeah. And they didn't particularly like it, but they loved the tempo. Yeah. So the only thing that they would do is they Sometimes you want to give me the click about this. I said, okay, all right, that's what you want. But I tell you, when they go and they start listening, everything. They listen and they listen, and before you know it, 15, 20 minutes have gone by. Right. That's how many times they listen. They look at each other, and they say, mm -hmm, and they start smiling. <laughs> they actually... Would you be sitting out at your drum still while they're listening? No, we're, the we're finally, that when they start listening, yeah. we realize that they are, they're there. I want to ask some technical questions. So we talked a little bit earlier, you're talking about kick drum size, 20 inch, 18 inch. Tell mm -hmm. me about how your, uh, that would develop. What is your preferred bass drum size? Why do you put your, why do you have your uh, larger tom to smaller tom there? Tell me how that developed. Oh. That part, the towns, yeah, just less work. It's just it, everybody at the time that we were doing things, do ga do ga do ga do ga do ga do ga dum. Right. That was it. It's just less work. Right. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about rushing. Mm -hmm. Everybody rushes fills. They do it automatically. Because they want to get in and get out. Right. But you don't have to worry. Either one. It's the same thing. Only it's not rubbly. It's smooth. Right. And, uh, and that's how I got around doing that figure. do ga do ga do ga do ga do ga do ga dum you are not going to get all that. It just doesn't hold because somebody else is going to be playing something differently over that. Right. Guaranteed. Right. So if you're going to make it work, keep it as simple as possible. Talk about the kick drum. What do you prefer, 20 or 18? I prefer the 20. Okay. Why? I did the 18. I did that only because, here we go again. Yep. Guys who like certain things and they want a uh, jazzy thing yeah it's more like Fine. a bebop, bebop bebop kit with yeah, the 18. Bebop, that's what they call it but not necessarily when they start hearing funk coming out of these little drum sets yeah it all came down to what it resolved what feel attitude and how it was recorded yeah the recording is always how it's recorded to stay out of the way. The 20 inch had a fat, had a really, really fat. Doom, doom. You can get this. And when you want to do something else, keep it simple. 
And when it stays that way for any length of time, you know. They like that. Oh, that oh, they like that. So they they keep it up and for half to almost all of the song. Because they got something. Now, that particular beat at that uh, pace, that's not the disco beat. Right. So, Do anything you want, it'll work if you don't overplay. Keep it simple, right? Back to that same old keep it simple, stupid. Why the China symbol? Oh, China. When I started learning about the China, I did like everybody else. I turned this upside down. Yep. But Mr. Zildjian. Yep is the one who showed me that, Mr. Purdy, I love the way you play, I love your sound, but I wanna show you something. And he had no sticks in his hands, and he'd do this. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> nice. Then I asked him, I said, why didn't you use the six? He said, I didn't have to. You want to hear the symbol or do you want to crash the symbol? You can crash it. You can do anything you want. But if you really want to understand what the symbols are about, it's where you actually play it. Here is the best sound of the symbol. That's the real sound of the symbol. Whether it goes up, or whether it goes down. China. Right here. Right here on the, what we call the shoulder. Yeah. And then when you want to sneak something else in, you go up a little higher. And then you don't have as much overtone and much ring. And you go up a little bit higher. You can do three, four different ones before you come all the way up. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. That way you control all of the sounds and the things that you want. Everybody that turns this upside down, you're going to get one sound. That's right. That's all you're going to get. So I don't care who you are or what you're doing. That's all you're going to get because it's a China boy. And that's how you play it. Just... Bernard, how important is it to balance yourself in the room? That's everything, right? That's everything. I learned that from the engineers. Mm -hmm. 
The engineers have always been around long before me. Now they know what works and what doesn't work for the room. I had to learn how to control everything. In the beginning, I had put tape on the top or put tape underneath to lose so much of the overtone. Mm -hmm. And that overtone was the ring. I did all that in the beginning, and then I had to ask myself, the sound that I'm hearing, do I like it or will this work? Because in the beginning, for the first few years, the drums were not up. So I started figuring out, let me try some tape. Let me try a little tape, whether I tried it on top or underneath. I just wanted to get rid of some of the overtone and the ring. And once I did that, the engineers were, oh, yes, we love it. We love it. <laughs> But I thought that the sound was, <laughs> but I understood them because then they could put something else in. Because it's not taking up so much space. Exactly. Right. Are there songs that you hear back that you think, oh, I don't like that drum sound on that? Things that you've played on or ones that you say, even better yet, what are, what are some songs that you say, I love that drum sound? Are, mm. there, are there ones that come to mind? I got the sound that I wanted from RCA, Columbia, Allegro, then it was Generation, then it was Broadway, then all of them, and over at Rudy Van Gilders. Ooh wee! Once I got myself into them and they liked what they heard, I know that the drums are going to be on top. You're going to hear the drums no matter what because I kept it simple. So I noticed that you don't bury the beater on the, you, you come off the head on the exactly. kick drum. Exactly. Exactly. Talk about that, about the tone, about how it changes the tone by not burying the beater. Well, not, not only does it not, it doesn't change the tone, but it, makes and gives them a chance to turn it up right. more volume and this way it fits the whole set you want everything to fit and you want it to work together here this figure here that'll work every time that i want to play a particular fill and nothing else is happening especially when if you got horns on it and you got background singers I'll stick that in and know that, ooh, yes, that's going to stay. That's going to stay no matter how many tracks they put on it. No matter how many tracks, because it works. And they can put something on top, they can put something underneath, or right on. After a while, I <laughs> lost. It gets lost. Yeah. Very simple for me. And beat and a half is all I would use to make a fill. But I'd make that thing so dynamic. Just that one time when something happens, and this way they don't have to push the beat up, and they can work with it, and when they get it, they got it. When you're playing on the kick too, you're using a lot of dynamics in the oh. bass drum. Yes. A lot of dynamics. Yes. I love engineers who are listening to what I'm doing and I love them when they feel that if something is overpowering or overshadowing at a particular section, they know how to pull it down. But they, they, they don't do this. They just... Bring it back a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. And they get the dynamics of it because it's not overshadowing. It's, you never overshadow the lead. You very seldom ever, ever overshadow the background singings. Horn players, if you're smart, you listen to where the horn players got figures that they're doing 
and you play part of their figure at the end of the phrase. For example. For example, da dicky boom. Da 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 da. It's out of the way of the horns. And old fashioned shuffle, oh, you know, when the horn's gonna do their things, did it, did it, did it, did it. You get something like that, that's like, ooh, yeah, that, that, you know. <laughs> you, you just get happy. I oh, never overshadow that lick. Cause that lick, let it come through. And then all of a sudden, the drums come through. Ooh, enhance that. You think as, a, as an arranger, mm -hmm. and you think because of being a studio drummer for so many years, you know how these parts are gonna work with the song. Mm -hmm later on when all when everything is put on this and you know okay i'm going to take these spots just like in green earrings there you knew that you had that spot before the guitar solo do that build up and put your hi-hat in there but that's the mm -hmm. fill you didn't have to play a, a fill exactly that's the fill so and it only needed to be that the other part of that which is why and how i recorded so much is that I'd walk over to the piano and see what the arrangement was. See it, hear it, play it. And only play the end of it. Not the whole thing. Let the horns have their thing. And when they finish, you know, whether the da 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 da, you know, my hi hat could be right in the middle of it. <laughs> da 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 da. Catch it on the end and fill it. Just, just enough to bring everything together, to satisfy everybody. The arranger, he's going to be happy because he's getting the figure that he wrote and it's being enhanced by me of playing a little bit of it. Yes, I read music, but I had to understand what all the other stuff went about. It took years for people to really know that I did, because they didn't think so. They thought that I just memorized so much. Of it. I said, okay, as long as you call me, that's fine. Right. But when I needed to know something, when I walk in the studio, I go look and I start smiling. The horn players always had good licks. and It's just something that it would always stand out. So my teacher, Mr. Haywood, he did the same thing. Now, I didn't really know what he was doing in the beginning, but I always knew when he would end up coming out and being endings with the horns, the singers, the background singers, they also had to come out and come in and give something. So everybody had a place. So that's what I would do. I would go over look at the piano chart and you can see where it came in, the figures that they're going to do. You don't want the horn to be overkill because the man wrote it. They wrote it out. That's a figure that they want. Yep. Let it happen. And what are the things that your teacher would have you work on? What was it like? What, for example, what would be the would he say, these are the kind of grooves that, that, that I want you to work on? Like, what kind of things? Would you practice rudiments? What would you do? I would tell it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play, play a couple other things. Today's special is Memphis Soul Stew. <laughs> we sell so much of this, people wonder what we put in it. We're going to tell you right now. Give me about a half a teacup <laughs> of bass. Now I need a pound of fat back drums. <laughs> Now give me four tablespoons of ball in Memphis guitars. This is gonna taste all right. This is so great. <laughs> that is so grooving. 
I love the and I love the sound of that. The drums on that are hard pan to one speaker on this recording. Les Paul's son mm -hmm. was the engineer at Atlantic Records. We did this in California. Mm -hmm. We had already done some recording with other pieces of music with Curtis with his things. Yep. We talked and he did pan. He did. After panning, bam, he went back to the middle. So if this was heard on AM radio in mono, that it would sound right, right? Is that was that what that was one of the things about this? Yes. Yes. Is so that they would they would put it back and then it would sound good whether it was in stereo or in mono and the drums would be right on. Always center. My job was to keep it moving and keep it happening. So they put me back in the center. Do you think that this, the sound, because of the tighter sounds, the more controlled sounds by deadening the toms, this is what made drums, this is what actually brought drums up to the forefront in music in the 70s and you know on these records that we're talking about that people revere, like these Steely Dan records, that the drums are so important to it. Mm -hmm. Not just the groove, not just how great the drum parts are, but it's your sounds too and the way that you're playing them. Mm -hmm. The tuning of the drums, everything, they were able to move it forward right. and make it even more upfront than, they, than drums normally would be. You're exactly right, 100%. But that was what we worked on. This is the kind of stuff that we used to have fun with. He went to me, it, it was his son, yep. uh, Gene. Yep. And we rehearsed in the room. And he would record, right? And he would record till he got it the way he wanted. I mean, this was like, you know, this is how things So work. he would practice this. I mean, he would, he would actually work on the sounds by doing this. He'd have you come yes. in. Yes. And would he try different miking and different distancing, different, different distances of the mic, everything, right? His miking was always right on. He understood. Because by this time, we had been working together for a good five, six years at Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And we worked and had the sounds that we wanted. Let me ask you some specific things about this. Would, would you typically have just one mic on the snare that would pick up the hi-hat? Yes, right? Yes. Just a top, snare top mic, no snare bottom mic? No. And that would pick up the hi-hat? That would pick up the hi-hat. Snare. He did use the mic underneath on the uh, the bottom of the snare. Okay, but it had to be down. It wasn't the one that knocked everything else out. Cause this high, this one on top was the main part. He took up body. The body of the snare was where they mic'd underneath. The bass drum, yep. the microphone was over there, and then he had a little mic over here, but usually on this side. So, so in on uh, this side of the kick drum, bass yes. drum. But that is the one that was not the one that had the depth. That would just give you the attack. And the attack. And that one on the other side? Yeah. That gives you the tone and that's the, and the, the tone, fatness. That's the fatness. So we did all that, and then we came down because especially here, having the, the two toms, yep. the two tenor toms, and it was from underneath. So we didn't have to worry about leakage up here right. with the cymbals. Why did people start miking from the top then when you have all the cymbal bleed? Well, cy cymbal leakage just because makes so much more sense. Because nobody understood it. Right. Nobody understood it because very few people made the drums as an attack. It didn't. Right. That within itself stopped a lot of things because Aretha, you know, I know what she's going to do. Right. And I know how to come in and out. Everything was different. But Curtis was so good at it that he could play and his would be added when when you actually add it and you come down to the horn we were so tight 
nothing to get in the way. And it would be a small amount. And then when we go to the bridge, we're sailing. When were your first recordings in the in a recording studio? What year? Right, 1960. Okay, so in 1960, were they, they weren't even miking that close, were they? No. What would they have? How many mics would they have on a drum three. kit? I had three mics. Bass drum and, and two overheads, right? Bass drum. Uh, no, not two. Two room, yeah. room mics. One here that okay. covered the snare, the hi-hat. Yep. Uh, and then Just one, one mono here. room mic or something? Or one, one mic to catch the cymbals? To catch the cymbals. Yeah. But it was already mixed. As uh, not mono, it wasn't. Right. It didn't sound like mono. Right. It, was in, it was still stereo because yeah, it had stereo to imaging them. to them, right? Because that's how they were using things. Yeah, they used it. So, right here, with the mic that was the one mic was in one but three mics. Yeah, one but three mics. So the one here would be over all, but the consistency of the pop and the snap, right here on the snare mic. That snare mic yeah. that also took care of the hi-hat. Yeah. And I got my first sounds and everything. Psst, psst, psst. That, that, just that alone, it was under control. And I was doing it with ballads. Okay, so when did they start adding in more mics? All that got added in when you, you got to... With the uh, 70s? Is that, yeah, is that? yeah, by the 70s, yes. But you had more mics. Did people start with, saying, oh, you know, let's add a mic here. Let's add, let's mic the toms. Or when, when? 67, when I made my first record, my own. Yep. There I had five different mics. Okay. And where would those be? Uh, bass drum. Yep. Here, snare drum. Yep. Tom, over here. Yep. Symbols and nothing else to go with it. But he had a chamber. He used the hall. Yep. At his echo chamber. So my first record was <laughs> It was monster. It was monster. And right after that, that chamber that was in his hallway of the studio from the sixth floor up. I got so many records that all of a sudden, the drums got put into a hollow cell. But yet, I didn't lose my backbeat. My cross stick was always there. Yep. And my backbeat was always because I come off of the drums. Always played off. I never played to the point where you, you in the middle, no. Always rim, rim shot. I have rim shots. Did you always play rim shots? I played rim shots from the beginning. Okay. But I had to learn how to put it in because no one else uh, in, the, in the beginning, there was mono. Right. So I had to make it work for me. Yeah. So I would play it to a certain point, you know, and because... I was still playing uh, cross stick a yep. lot, you know, just and fun. But I could do that tempo up, you know, didn't have to be laid back. Mm -hmm. I could do it up and be on top of the beat, which is why I was able to do the Latin stuff, being on top of the beat, because practically everything. In Latin, in order for drums to work, you gotta be on top of the beat. And then I would also not, not necessarily do here, I would do quarters. I would add things that way. Then right, <laughs> then you lay off, just on the beat.
You do whatever you have to do to keep the beat going. You don't lay back. Wrong. Because when you start laying back, that means you're pulling everybody out. And then when I had to do dynamics and I had to push, quarter notes. Go anywhere I have to go. Being careful not to overplay mm -hmm. when the Kungas and the Timbales were doing the lead. Right, because they have so many, uh, you need the space for those. Need the space. Yeah. Okay, when you're doing cross stick and you're hitting the snare with the butt end of the stick, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you're not playing a song with cross stick, are you gonna play with, your, with uh, both sticks going in the same direction, or do you like the sound of your of a rim shot with the using the the stick turned around? The rim shot makes it easier for me. Yep. But when I need to make the power. Yep. It's a different sound using the the butt end of the stick. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I used to play just like everybody else. Yeah. I played traditional, conventional, yeah, traditional. Yeah. And then I end up have because of playing Latin. Yep. And reggae and all that. Yep. Well, the, the quarter note was so important. Yeah. At the time. Once it's established. I could do anything I want as long as I stayed out of the way of what the Kungas or Timbales. The ghost notes, the rebounds. Do you call them rebounds when you're doing when you're playing oh, yeah. playing the shovel? You call it a rebound, right? Hmm. It's rebounds. Rebounds. You, you gotta remember though. You still gotta remember not to over shatter. Maybe uh, let me just show you. Yeah. Let me just show you. Uh, step back too deep. Stay out of the way. You can play as loud as you want as long as you out on the stage. But when you in the recording studio, you gotta control everything and keep it down. The Latin thing was always the hardest to do. Always. The jazz thing, I just took myself back to what we were doing in the 40s <laughs> and 50s. That's all. But then I started to learn to control everything, no matter what it is, I mm -hmm. learned to control it because of the engineers. Took me right back to where all of these other things came about. Control. I loved it because they helped me. They, they really, truly helped me. 
And so I got used to the <laughs> to the sound of the <laughs> of the cymbal having tape on it. Yeah. So it didn't the ring was gone. So you got <clears throat> And not the right <laughs> the rolling thing, and I wanted stop. I wanted <clears throat> so I controlled the ring by using tape. Whether I use it on top, but most of the time I use it. In and the what bottom. would you use? Gaff tape? Yeah, gaff tape. I had to learn how to 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 adjust so i didn't use the wide one i just use it in half one part over here one part over here and not so much more on the top but underneath i'd have at least half one one two three wow four underneath wow wow but so, thin pieces though thin. yeah the thin ones. So the, the the ring would be gone. Right. But I can get, bam, bam, you know, you can crash it, crash it, and you get pew, 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 control. So they didn't have to worry. The engineers didn't have to worry if I got loud. Okay, every studio that you would go in to record, would you have a, sp a specific spot where you knew the drums sounded best? Would the drums be set up? Would, would you set them up or would you walk around and figure out, I mean, would you say, oh, in this studio, I always would set up here or would be different places all the time? People didn't know that there was two different things happening. It was called a guitar thing, the amp. They got amps that they put into 20, 30 studios. Right. From the amps, then it came down to bass amps. The guitar amps were first, then the bass amps, and then it became drums. We had 28 sets of drums, 18 to 20 studios. Okay. We'd have it like <laughs> body, uh, big old suitcase like you know with all the equipment in it yeah including cowbells including tambourines and everything else that's what we did we followed those guys we had to put the complete sets in a suitcase and then we would order the toms we would actually order the toms and they bring them up for the they session. would bring them up that's the carol music and the, the yeah. different ones they had four companies that's it at the time. I had three of those sets put into three different studios. Two other guys had two, and one other besides myself had three. Now, would you walk in with your cymbals, or would the cymbals be there? Would you walk Everything in with just your there. sticks? It just nothing. Yeah. You just walk in, everything's there. Put the cymbals, and, and if some, somebody else wanted to bring their own yeah. cymbals, yeah. well, first of all, they couldn't use the drum set that's there. Okay. What happened is that the engineers got a key made because so many guys didn't bring their cymbals because they thought everything was okay. Right. But it, we lost control of it. You know, but I had a good four or five years with equipment that I kept in the studios. And that's how often. I was doing 20 dates a week. That's what happened. Would you drive between studios if you were, uh, uh, would you be booked in different studios in, in, ever in, its, in the same day? Drive? I didn't have a car in the beginning. I took the bus. Took the bus. I took the bus and the bus driver. <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. I was, my apartment was on uh, 104th Street. Okay. And Broadway. Yeah. Uh, the bus number 104. Bring me all the way down to 42nd Street. So if I wanted to do something else, I had to go over to 7th, uh, over to Amsterdam Avenue to go further down. Right. You know, so I'm carrying the drums. Carrying. <laughs> Did you ever live in L.A. or not? 
No, I was commuting to L.A. Okay. I commuted to L.A. for seven years. I had a wonderful time. I enjoyed it, but I didn't, didn't want to live, live there. there I, right. I was happy commuting. Yeah. You know, because they paid for everything. The studios, the record labels that I worked for, I had 63 different labels. No problem, because I was making hits. Hits. Okay, so I want to ask you about the hit maker, about, about your sign. Mm -hmm. What did the sign say exactly? You done hired the hit maker. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it was really quite, quite simple. I ended up with three different signs and alternating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you need me, call me. Right. The hit maker. You done hired the hit maker. The <laughs> I just had fun. I loved it. So I had a good 15 to almost 15, 20 years of straight of recording. I you always, I, every time I see you, every, anytime I see you in a video and everything, you're always in a great mood. I'm happy. I'm happy to be able to play and use the talent that was given to me. But Mr. Haywood, who guided me to the right parts, I mean, in one sense, I hated the man because he told me I was going to be teaching. I didn't want to teach because you say the same thing week after week, month after month, and year after year. Right. But the point is, is that that's what I needed. That's what I needed because it was there. It was in, in me. It was all in me. And I didn't know any better than to do. I did what he said. But I had to learn diplomacy because I had a big mouth. And when I say big mouth, I felt like God. And I'm not God. I'm just good at what I do because I had to learn to be that way. But my mouth got me into trouble many times. It really did. I had arrangers that... <laughs> <laughs> they arrange something, and but then you tell the arranger that it doesn't quite go with what you. <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> and I was right, but the point is that you don't do it. Right. You just don't do that. So I had what two? I think only only about two arrangers who took me off their books. And I really had to think, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm making a lot of money with this man, so what did I do wrong? And you find out, you find out, because, uh, you know, I, I just know when something is right, and you can't be so smart that you be right all the time. And I was right all the time. And I tell people, I would actually tell them, I just, Man, my feelings and, and everything else, my hands would go up. And then what made it even worse, my face. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I'd end up doing this. Ow. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, they got you I, into trouble. I got, I got myself into trouble. And, and, and I, I couldn't, I had no other filter. Bernard, what do you want your legacy to be? I'd like to be the happiest drummer in the world. <laughs> as far that as I'm sounds, concerned, I love what I, think I you've do. I you've achieved that. I love what I do. I just received one of the first major, major accolades in my hometown. They put up a mural that's 15, almost 20 feet high. It's on the wall in a new building that has uh, just less than two years old. And I'm like, I can't believe, I can't believe, I, I, I just can't believe 
I was so happy. I was I was crying the whole time when I just saw it. Huh? And it's only what, two months, two, three months ago. Three months ago, my hometown gave me a day. Burnout Purdy Day. Now, next year coming, a scholarship. Fantastic. Burnout Purdy Scholarship. Excellent. It's been such an honor to meet you and to sit a couple of feet from you and hear you play when I've listened to you for the last 40, 50 years play on records. And thank you so much for doing this. And well, I want to thank you for, you know, everything that you've asked me. Nobody, nobody kept it that way. You know, I, I've been, I got myself into trouble a couple of times with different things. <coughs> This was open. Cool. This was an open and shut case. Wonderful. Enjoyable. Glad to do it. And you were smart enough. You <laughs> hit it right on the nail every time. <laughs> and I had to smile because nobody, nobody has hit everything like it's supposed to be. Having this kind of interview was precious to me. Well, I... I mean, I, I really appreciate it so much. Such an honor, sir. It's a pleasure for me.